Shalom, everyone. Thank you for joining us on another edition of Seekers of Meaning. We are grateful for your time. These podcasts, as you know, help to explore issues that relate to the implications of the revolution in longevity uh, on our families, ourselves, and our community. I'm your host, Rabbi Richard Address, and you can reach me at Rabbi Address at JewishSacredAging.com and our website, JewishSacredAging.com. These podcasts are part of our work at Jewish Sacred Aging, and we appreciate your support, and we are very grateful for your attention and support to our work. And if you'd like to continue to uh, support this work, if you could go to the website, JewishSacredAging.com, and click on the Donate button at the top of the page and follow the promise, we'll be very, very grateful for, for any help that you can give us. Um, one of the issues that keeps coming up in our workshops around uh, North America and in congregations and organizations has to do with issues of the supernatural and we uh, afterlife and what that means. And so we are very, very pleased to welcome back for an encore after a, <laughs> a extended period of time, Rabbi Stephen Carroll, uh, who is the author of a brand new book called Embracing the Supernatural in Judaism subtitled signs from our deceased loved ones and stories about the world to come it's just quite a mouthful steve welcome welcome back Thank welcome you. back to seekers of meaning how are you doing good how are you i'm i'm hanging in i'm hanging in talk to me about this uh this uh, very interesting book um what what motivated you to do this um so after um my previous book came out 4 years ago I would uh, go to synagogues pre-pandemic. Uh, during pandemic, I would do Zoom talks about that book. And um, people would ask questions about the afterlife, which I would answer. And I would throw in, I also believe that it's possible for us to have communication from our deceased loved ones. And then that would prompt people to tell their own stories about a sense of their loved one's presence, um, signs that they had received. So I decided to do a little bit of research into it and found out there's this whole body of literature about signs and that Judaism, uh, and in particular traditional texts, spent a lot of time talking about it. Uh, the other piece of it is that my wife is a believer in signs, and I had several experiences with her that basically won me over. Uh, you talk about what you talk about a little bit out of the beginning of the book about signs. So tell me, tell me about one of the signs that you had. Okay, uh, there are a lot to choose from, but um, so one of the one of the signs that comes to mind is that I was conducting a funeral for a man that I didn't know, and. Um, his wife and two children gave the eulogies. And in the eulogies, they talked about him having a well-deserved reputation as being the fix-it man, that he could fix everything in the house by using rubber bands, duct tape, and paper clips. And when he would do it, he would say, well, now everything's okay. So um, I do the funeral. Um, I head out to my car. And in front of me on the grass near my car is a rubber band. Um, I'd been doing funerals at that funeral home for 15 years. I had never picked up a rubber, rubber band or seen one. So I picked it up, um, put it on my wrist, met them at the cemetery. And before I started the ceremony there, I went up to them and uh, I said, I found this on the ground outside the funeral home and i said i believe that it's your husband and your father telling you that everything's going to be okay and they got choked up what was their reaction well they got choked right. up and nodded their heads and um so we all see it, it gave them a lot of comfort so that's just one of the experiences so, you know I know you write about a lot of this in, 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 in the book and, and credit your wife as you just did with, with a lot of opening some of these doors. And, um, we also know that in, that in the Jewish tradition, there's this whole 
uh, what do you want to call it, a subtext or tradition that we rarely talk about in our scientific, uh, very, very um, rational world, but it's there. One of the one of the phrases that you use, one of the concepts I'd like you to walk us through is um, Gilgul HaNefesh. What, what is that? So <clears throat> Gilgul HaNefesh uh, means the sort of, re I guess you could say, recycling of the soul. So uh, my understanding of it is that uh, when we die, our souls return to God in the world to come. Um, there are those within Judaism who believe that we have one, more than one opportunity at life. And it's referred to as Gilgol Hanefesh, or another, another explanation of, of it is uh, reincarnation, another term for it. Um, and I have been told uh, that my soul has been reincarnated, which explains why I'm able to do something that you can't explain scientifically now, if i remember correctly the last time you were here uh on your first book this ties and, and you allude to this in in your present book you tied something in i with was it a grandfather that that there was this linkage because i it, walk me through that it, it, un, unpack that for me <laughs> a, 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 again because you mentioned that a couple of Right. You know, programs ago. Go ahead. OK, so I'll try to do a, a quick unpacking of it. Um, and it is it is in the in the second book. Um, my grandfather, my mom's father died when she was 11. My mom lived and continued to live in the home where she had lived with her parents. After my mom and dad got married, they moved into that home with my grandmother. Um, I lived there with them until I was 15 months old. For some uh, previously inexplicable reason, I am able to give you a visible virtual tour of every piece of furniture in every room of that home. And um, and when, when I used to tell my parents, like they got kind of spooked by it. They didn't want to talk about it. And, and my whole point about signs is that they're not spooky. They're good things. So I, I presented this to one of my Orthodox cousins and she said, Oh, Gilgol Hanefesh. I said, Well, I know what that means, but what do you mean? She said, You, you have grandpa's soul in you. Grandpa lived in that house. That's why you now remember everything that was in that house. So that that's what I was told about that. So you know, this opens up a lot of the conversation about past lives and reincarnation, or um, and obviously there are other religious traditions who who hold these truths and, and these beliefs to be very very important. Um, in your writing, in the experience, in your own personal life, you you allude to the fact even at the beginning and even in the you now are a firm believer in this, your, your own belief that you've, not only your grandfather, but other lives. Do you think that you've had other lives? Yeah, I think there's a possibility of it, although nothing is as vivid as that particular memory. I mean, I think past, past lives are possible because I have come, I've come to believe, and I don't believe in a radical way, uh, that God is powerful in many ways, that God loves us, uh, that God uh, gives us the opportunity with our lives to to be who we can be and to do what we can. Um, and, I, and I think that there is a possibility that God provides for us, that we get more than one chance at it. My, my main focus of the book, though, is, is to alert people to the possibility that they can be receptive to receiving signs. So they come in the form of a sense of a loved one's presence or an animal that appears out of nowhere or long lost things that all of a sudden get found, um, music that plays without any explanation at all, 
Um, there, there are a lot of different categories. One, one of my favorites actually is in the, the photos chapter where I was sent photos from people who took pictures. And when the pictures were taken, there weren't any lights or any shadows in them. Yet when the picture comes out without any trick photography, there is a light there, like a, a sun ray or like, um, an image of a person that wasn't there physically, but that, that the people felt there spiritually. Uh, and I'm just fascinated by all of that. And the more I talk about it to more people, the more people there are that want to admit that they've had the same experience. So again, we're talking with Rabbi Stephen Carroll, the author of, of Embracing the Supernatural in Judaism, and we're talking a little bit about signs and... Um, Steve, what's sh- oh? You talk a little bit about that for people who may have heard it in synagogue or read about it, but w- related to the book, sh- oh. Okay. One of the main points of the book is that um, is that Jewish belief about the afterlife has changed over the centuries. In the Bible, there was talk about when you died, your body went down to Sheol, which was identified as the pit or darkness. Um, when, th- when this was mentioned in the Bible, in the Tanakh, there, there wasn't talk of soul yet in Judaism. So your body would go there and would, wouldn't return from there. There's a familiar phrase in the Hebrew Bible that someone would sleep with their fathers or go to their fathers. Uh, which which meant that they would sort of be reunited with their ancestors, kind of like what a lot of people talk about now, hopefully. So Shaol was just a dark pit. Later on in the rabbinic period, um, first starting first century, second century CE, then the sense of, of soul and body came into being. Shaol, the idea of Shaol was kind of abandoned, and that's where the idea of the world to come develop the olam haba so that's what we talk about now if people go to synagogue and they hear somebody talking about shaul that would be pretty unusual unless it's in the torah portion right 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 so you have this very interesting quote from um i think it's from rabbi lamb a blessed member the which says the afterlife is not a theory to be proven logically or demonstrated by rational analysis it is axiomatic it is to the soul what oxygen is to the lungs. There is little meaning to life. The God demands constant strivings to all of his achievements unless there is a world beyond the grave. That's a, unquote, that's a very, very powerful quote that the fact that there's little meaning um, to everything we're doing unless there's something beyond the now mm-hmm. um how does that fly into the i mean in our rational western <laughs> religious world did, you know did did we did 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 people create this concept in order to, to alleviate or mitigate the fear of their own death okay first of all Rabbi Lamb was an Orthodox rabbi, so he is, he is saying what you would expect an Orthodox rabbi to say. Um, <clears throat> secondly, within Orthodox and conservative, and in some reform synagogues, within the liturgy is, uh, as some people know, a prayer for resurrection of the dead. And there's talk about an afterlife. So it's, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of normal uh, for him to be saying that. The, the rub comes from, for those of us who are reform and who historically have, have, uh, rejected the supernatural. Um, and, you know, it, it just doesn't fit in. The, the question about how that fits in with the logical belief, that's a great one. Great question. And, um, in, in addition to quoting Lamb, I quote Neil Gilman, who wrote about resurrection and immortality. Right. And, um, and Gilman talks about that he believes in the resurrection of the dead. 
if he were be, to be strictly logical, he could not believe it. But he says, and there's a quite great quote from him in the book, that I'm not just a, a logical human being. I'm an emotional human being, too. And I'm very comfortable with the idea that sometimes I'm logical and sometimes I'm emotional. So, um, so I think it's possible, contrary to what I was taught as a Reformed Jew, that we can live with the, the logical and the illogical. Um, and do I think that people created a belief in the afterlife? Um, yeah, it's, it's possible. Um, that they, that they did that, whoever it was, whenever it was. But I'm, I have become very comfortable with, I've, I think I've always believed in an afterlife. I don't think that's unusual. Um, I, but I just, I think I've grown very comfortable with having that sort of dichotomy of some things are still very logical to me and others aren't. Resurrection of the dead fascinates me. I would love to believe in it. I don't pray for it. However, when I do funerals here on Long Island with a particular funeral home, they provide a bag of Israeli soil to be put into the, um, into the ground with the casket to fulfill the traditional belief that when the Messiah comes, there'll be a resurrection of the dead. And anyone buried outside the land of Israel with Israeli soil in their grave no matter how long ago it was put there, is going to be transported through subterranean tunnels to the land of Israel, to Jerusalem, to the Mount of Olives, to greet the Messiah. And I tell people, when we do this custom, I don't believe in it logically, but I could be wrong. So I have instructed my wife that if I predecease her and, or my daughter, whatever the case may be, that I want Israeli soil in my grave. So you got the logical and the illogical right there. Is that the uh, the philosophy of just in case or it couldn't hurt? Yeah, I mean, I, I sometimes, depending on, on the people that are there and they know that I'm not joking, I say I kind of regard this as, as, a, as a, a Jewish insurance policy, a religious insurance policy. So, look, you're... You're a reform rabbi. You mentioned that you 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 served the congregation. Uh, you re, you retired from the from the pulpit. Um, when you when you led a service recently, or when you pray now, when you get to that second paragraph of the Amidah, and there's the paragraph of Michai Meitim, you know, makes living the dead. Do you pray that, or 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 do you say it, or do you just say it to yourself, or how do you actualize that? Okay, in your wor in your worship in style. my worship style. So uh, my worship style, whether I'm on the bima or off the bima, is that I don't say it. You don't no, say it. I don't. Uh, maybe it's just force of habit that I don't say it, or maybe it it's the it's the freedom that I feel to believe that I can that I can leave something out of a, out of a prayer that I would like to believe in. The other thing about being a retired rabbi, I, I retired eight years ago, and I haven't led a service since then until I'm going to do one a week from this Friday. I'm subbing for the rabbi. They asked me to do the service, and because I'm emeritus and I do what the rabbi does, he doesn't pray for it, so I'm not going to pray for it. Right. I understand okay. that. Uh, in, in our tradition, and, and in talking about embracing the supernatural in Judaism, um, what's the role of angel? Ooh, <laughs> that's a really good one. Um, so in the book, I talk about angels as they're portrayed in the Tanakh. We, and so we have mostly good angels in the Tanakh. In later Jewish writings, we have some bad right. angels, including Satan's, Satan, uh, Satan in Hebrew. Um, I see angels certainly in our religious literature as uh, being God's helpers, as doing things that will benefit, usually benefit people, and they do it on behalf of God. Um, I have a more expansive um, 
definition of angels. I have referred to people as angels when they do something that is a great mitzvah for them to do, or they're like, uh, uh, you know, the, the port in the storm that people need, or they help people and they do what I regard as godly work. And so I, that's, that's how I refer to angels. So I guess it could be with a capital A and with a, with a lowercase a. Before we run out of time, you, I do want to pick up on something you said a little while ago, because I think it w- will touch a lot of people. And I'm really happy that you included it in the book. Um, you have a section on animals. Yes. And, um, walk, walk us through that because, you know, all of a sudden you're reading this and, you know, it goes through the pictures and everything. And then all of a sudden we get to that section of animals as signs. And I, I know people have talked about this, etc. So very quickly, just why this section on animals? Um, I, I had heard for a long time before I came to believe in signs, um, about something special of cardinals, that red cardinals, when they appear, are uh, a connection to the next world. When I started doing my research um, it, with the science literature, I found out that it wasn't just them. It could be butterflies, or it could be eagles or hawks. Um, it's mostly birds that are regarded as as carrying signs, being the channels, so to speak, for communication from the deceased. Really, and so it, among the seventy five stories that I collected that are in the book, um, there are a couple of them that describe um, animals that people felt were signs for them. One of them is um, is uh, an eagle that uh, that appeared one of, one of my friends from my previous congregation died in a plane crash his favorite it wasn't an eagle his favorite uh, uh bird was a red tail hawk um when when his widow and her mother and brother went to visit the cemetery about a month after he died there was a red tail hawk that was on a tree near them watching them the whole time it just appeared out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. When uh, then a, a, a certain time later, she was uh, doing something outside. I, I don't have the story off the top of my head right now. And uh, she was trying to decide what to do. And a red tailed hawk came and was just standing there looking at her. And she felt, based on her previous experience, that this was not coincidence, that it, was, it wasn't dumb luck, that there was some, some significance to the fact that a red-tailed hawk was her husband's favorite bird, and she felt a sense of his presence in both of those occasions, as well as other times. So a, a lot of times, um, it's birds. Rabbi Stephen Carroll, Embracing the Supernatural in Judaism, subtitled Signs from Our Deceased Loved Ones and Stories About the World to Come. Uh, Steve, good luck with this book. It's It opens up a lot of interesting conversation um, and invites people to really take a different look at the world in which they're living and um, may have been living before. So I would, so thank you very much and and good luck with this. I guess it's available at the usual places, including uh, Mr. Amazon. Yeah, well, actually at Amazon, not at Barnes and Noble because it's published by Amazon. So people can get it from Amazon Uh or if they want to contact me. I will send them a personally signed copy of the book. And if they wanted to contact you, what? how would they uh, do that? Send me an email at Rabbi Stephen Carroll, S-T-E-P-H-E-N-K-A-R-O-L at gmail.com. It's already started, and I'm already starting to give talks about the book, Steve. too, so that's good. So good. Again, thank congratulations. You. Mazel tough on the book. Hatzlacha. Good luck. You Stay too. healthy. And thank you for joining us today. And to all of you, thank you, all of you, for uh, joining us on today's edition of Seekers of Meaning, the podcast and TV arm of Jewish Sacred Aging. And again, uh, if you'd like to help support us in our work and these podcasts to the website, go JewishSacredAging.com. 
and just click on the donate button and follow the prompt. Seekers of Meaning is produced at the Broadcast Center of Lubetkin Media Companies in Cherry Hill. And thank you, Steve Lubetkin, who is our producer and tech guru. Thank you for joining us. I am your host, Rabbi Richard Address, and I look forward to greeting you on our next Seekers of Meaning TV show and podcast. And in the meantime, shalom, stay safe, stay healthy, and be kind to everybody. Take care. Shalom.